Hi, I'm Lisa Weiland with the Wabash Valley Astronomical Society. This video is about telescope mounts. We'll assume you've already watched our telescope fair overview and accessories videos for prerequisite information and terminology we'll be using. To get off the ground with this video, let's first talk about literally getting your telescope off the ground. Having a telescope for astronomy without any way to support it and hold it steady is pretty useless. We need to use something to hold it at a comfortable viewing height. What that something is depends on the size and type of the telescope you're using. Some telescope mounts are designed to sit directly on the ground, such as these Newtonian reflectors with Dobsonian mounts. Part of these mounts elevate the telescope to a usable height. Some smaller telescopes can sit on a tabletop, car hood, or even on milk crates for comfortable viewing. Large and heavy telescopes are those that will always be in the same location, can be installed on a permanent pier for exceptional stability. Many small to moderate sized telescopes are elevated to a comfortable viewing height with tripods. If you get a tripod, be sure that it's strong enough to support the weight of your telescope's optical tube, mount, eyepieces, and anything else you might have attached to the telescope. Light duty tripods may hold a small telescope or camera just fine, but they're prone to vibration that can make the telescope shake and the image of the object you're viewing will bounce around and be hard to follow. Heavier tripods may be harder to carry, but they're much more stable and not affected as much by minor vibrations, such as from the wind, minor bumping, or just walking past your telescope. Now that we know some ways that the telescope and their mounts can be supported, let's look at the mounts themselves. As we mentioned in the telescope fair overview video, a telescope's mount is equally or possibly more important for good viewing than the telescope's optics. The mount determines how easily the telescope moves and how stable the image is. A mediocre telescope on a good mount will give better results than a good telescope on a mediocre mount. There are generally two different types of telescope mounts, altitude azimuth, usually just called alt-as, and equatorial. Altitude azimuth mounts move the telescope relative to the horizon. Equatorial mounts move the telescope relative to the celestial equator. These are more complex and difficult to use mounts, but they're better for long exposure astrophotography and single axis simplicity of motion. Let's look at each mount type in more detail. Altitude means how high up something is, so altitude here refers to moving the front end of a telescope up and down. Azimuth is a measure of how far something is turned along a circular path, so azimuth here refers to rotating your telescope to the left or to the right. The most common types of Altaz mounts are Dobsonian, tripod pan and tilt heads, and some fork attached bases. Let's look at these Altaz mount variations. A Dobsonian mount is a simple and inexpensive Altaz mount for a telescope. A mount like this can be purchased or easily built out of plywood and a bit of Teflon. A simple Dobsonian alt as mount lets you aim at an object and track it by moving it up, down, and left and right relative to the horizon. Here's up and down, left, right. We have a refractor that's on an alt as. And we have a little fork mounted alt as scope. 
A simple and inexpensive pan and tilt head can be attached to a tripod. Most camera tripods come with them already attached. A camera or small telescope can be attached to the pan head for easy altitude and azimuth movement. These optical tubes are supported by one or two fork arms and they rotate up, down, and left, right. As shown, these are in an alt-as configuration. Before we can talk about equatorial mounts, we must first look at how celestial objects appear to move and why they move that way. Aiming a telescope at a celestial object is just one thing we need to do when observing. Tracking is another. The apparent motion of stars and other objects across the sky is called diurnal motion. Let's look at that. The Earth rotates on its axis once a day toward the east, creating diurnal motion. We know what diurnal motion looks like during the day, with the sun rising in the east, crossing the sky, and setting in the west. Here's what diurnal motion looks like at night. As we stand on a spinning Earth, the stars, moon, planets, and other objects appear to move across the sky as we turn to face them. In reality, the stars are not moving. It's just that we are, as we can see when we change our perspective. Since the stars are actually fixed, we can map their positions by imposing a coordinate system on them similar to latitude and longitude that we learned about in geography class. But we can't quite use these same coordinates on the sky directly because longitude depends upon starting at a specific point on the Earth. The prime meridian through London was assigned as the standard starting point for longitude centuries ago but we'll need a starting point on the sky to map the stars. If we extend the line between the Earth's poles, its rotational axis, out into space to infinity, the points where the line intersects the celestial sphere are called the North Celestial Pole, or the NCP, and the South Celestial Pole, or the SCP. Similarly, Projecting the Earth's equator out onto the celestial sphere defines the celestial equator on the sky. We will use the celestial poles and celestial equator as reference points for a new coordinate system. The celestial coordinate system is analogous to Earth's lines of latitude and longitude. The counterpart of latitude is called declination, or dec, and is measured in degrees, minutes of arc, and seconds of arc, above or below the celestial equator. Like Earth's equator, the celestial equator is considered to be at zero degrees. Dec readings south of the celestial equator have a minus sign out in front of them. Dec readings north of the celestial equator have a plus sign in front, or no sign at all in front. The counterpart of longitude is called right ascension, or RA. Since Earth rotates once every 24 hours, there are 24 lines of RA in total marked off in units of time, hours, minutes, and seconds, instead of degrees like longitude. Also, instead of starting at the Earth's prime meridian through London, Right ascension is measured from a known point in the sky eastward from zero hours, or RA0, all the way around to 24 hours, which is back to the same point in the sky. RA0, shown here by the red line, is analogous to the prime meridian as the origin of measurement, but RA goes through the point in the sky where the sun appears to be at the instant of the spring, or vernal, equinox. This point is known as the first point of Aries. Some 2,150 years ago, this point was in the constellation Aries, but at the current time, this first point of Aries is actually located in the constellation Pisces, 
This is because of the westward drift of the equinox point by about one degree every 72 years. In this diagram, only half of the RA hour lines have been drawn in, so there's a black line for every two hours of right ascension. Lines of right ascension are, by circular measure, drawn 15 degrees apart for each hour, and they run vertically from pole to pole. Lines of declination run horizontally, parallel to the celestial equator, here shown in white. The primary advantage of the celestial coordinate system is that it's mostly independent of the Earth's rotation. Each star or celestial object can be pinpointed by specifying its right ascension and declination coordinates. The equatorial grid on star charts consists of lines of right ascension and declination. You can interpolate between these lines for coordinates of any charted object. Now that we've looked at the motion of objects across the sky and discussed how to map the sky, we'll next look at the advantages of equatorial mounts for tracking objects. Since diurnal motion causes celestial objects to appear to constantly move, we need to constantly move the telescope if we want to keep an object in our eyepiece for more than just a minute or so. Remember that the objects appear to follow arcs across the sky from the time they rise until the time they set. To follow these arcs with a scope on an all to as mount, we need to keep nudging it to the side and also up or down, as shown by the green line here. Moving a telescope mount in two directions, which creates this stair step pattern, makes it hard to precisely track an object when you want to do long exposure astrophotography or if you just want to follow it visually for a while. An equatorial mount can follow an object by moving the mount in only one direction, following a smooth path as shown by the red line. Equatorial mounts are more complicated and usually more expensive than Altaz mounts, but their simpler tracking of celestial objects makes them superior for astrophotography or longer term observations. So let's take a closer look at these mounts. The bottom line principle of an equatorial mount is this. If we aim the polar axis of the telescope mount toward the celestial pole, just rotating the telescope around this axis will keep the object we want to see in view as it moves across the sky. Note that the telescope itself can be moved to point in any direction. Here we see the simulated time-lapse motion of an equatorial mount as it tracks the sun. Declination remains constant as the telescope rotates around the polar axis in right ascension. The German equatorial mount has a polar axis that you aim toward the north celestial pole, which is near the star Polaris in the northern hemisphere. It also has a declination axis, which aims the scope north and south of the celestial equator. Remember, lines of declination are parallel to the celestial equator. With the polar axis aligned with your celestial pole, you need only to rotate the telescope and counterweights around that axis to follow whatever object you aim at. The declination angle remains constant as the mount moves along in right ascension. To set up your equatorial mount, follow the manufacturer's directions. During the setup process, telescopes need to be balanced to minimize stress on the mount components. This also makes movement of the telescope and mount as smooth as possible. Installing a finder scope and or camera will change the balance point of your system, so move your scope and counterweights accordingly.
When you're setting up your telescope and mount, extend the tripod legs until the tripod's top is about waist high. You also want to make sure it's level. A bubble level can be used for this, or you can just kind of eyeball it. Also double check the latitude setting. Make sure it's still set at about that of your location. If you're planning to do long exposure astrophotography, do a polar alignment that's as accurate as possible. If you're just observing visually, you can point your scope's polar axis to the north, assuming you live in the northern hemisphere. You can use a compass if you can't see the north star. To perform a precise polar alignment, follow your manufacturer's instructions. Once your mount's polar axis is pointed north, you're ready to start observing. Here's our polar axis. It's pointing to the celestial pole. Motion is around this axis. Remember, axis is the imaginary stick that runs through the center of this thing. Okay, the telescope and counterweights move in a circle about this axis. Just like the stars move around in a circle about the pole. Motion around this axis the right ascension axis is with respect to the celestial pole. Here's our declination axis. It's dead obvious because it has the long stick with the counterweights hanging off of it. Okay, motion around this axis is with respect to the celestial equator. Recall that the celestial equator goes from east to west across the sky. That's east to west across the sky. In the alt mount, the up and down motion is with respect to the horizon. In this mount, the motion is different, just a little. You can't say it's up and down, but it is instead north and south of the celestial equator. This simplifies tracking because your scope is on a declination arc that's parallel to the celestial equator. So when the scope is turned in right ascension with the declination fixed, like here I've got a fixed declination, and then turned in right ascension, your object stays right in the eyepiece just by moving in one direction only. On most equatorial mounts, there are two clutch latches, right ascension and declination, commonly referred to as just RA and DEC. Loosen both manually to move and aim the telescope. You can use the finder to locate the object, or you can approximate its location using the setting circles. Given these two motions, we can find anything in the sky. But I want to say while you're using your finder, you're going to want to keep, I, I would go for trying to line it up in right ascension first. And you want to keep one of your hands on that right ascension latch and then lock that down and then find what you're doing in declination. You want to have one hand on a latch when you start looking through the finder because latches can be hard to find in the dark. But there's a caveat here. You have to be careful and make sure that you never move the mount manually with the clutches and gears engaged. Release the clutch latches if you're moving the mount manually and then tighten the knobs Otherwise, you could damage your drive gears, resulting in costly repairs or maybe even the total trashing of your mount. If you're using a motor drive, you have to keep out a watchful eye because eventually as you cross the meridian with a German equatorial mount, your scope will stall out. It will hit its own tripod or mount and that can damage your scope. It can damage your mount. So before this happens, you're going to have to perform an operation known as a meridian flip.
Doing this is a two-step process. Um, first, you're going to want to rotate your right ascension axis 12 hours. That's 180 degrees. And we drop the counterweights down to do it, down toward the ground. Okay, that's 180 degrees. Next, you want to move your declination axis 180 degrees as well. To do that, make sure that you're turning the objective lens toward the north. Keep it going toward the north, and then we just turn through the north, and we get back to, that's our 180 degrees, lock that down, and we should be right back to where we were in the sky. The eyepiece and finder may need some adjustment. You may need to rotate your tube here to get your eyepiece and finder back into a usable position. Note that the meridian flip is only needed for German equatorial mounts. A fork-supported equatorial mount doesn't have this problem. Some Altas mounts can become equatorial mounts with the addition of specialized equipment. An Altaz mount can become an equatorial mount simply by tilting the azimuth axis to align with the celestial pole. The image on the left shows the Altaz configuration with the azimuth axis, not to be confused with the azimuth circle at the base, the axis, pointing straight overhead to the zenith, which is the point 90 degrees up from the horizon. With the addition of a piece of equipment known as a wedge, as shown on the right, a fork mount becomes equatorialized, and the azimuth axis gets tilted to point at the pole, which also makes the azimuth circle tilt up from the horizon to instead be parallel to the celestial equator. For tripod-supported fork mounts, an equatorial wedge can be installed below the mount and tilted at the observer's latitude angle toward Polaris. This makes the mount equatorial since it now rotates about the polar axis. Some equatorial telescope mounts can have a motor drive which moves the telescope for you around the polar axis at the same rate as the stars move across the sky. This effectively means that the telescope tracks the object without the need for continuous manual adjustments. A motor drive can either be built in or added on, but only for mounts designed for them. Such scopes often have a motorized declination up and down control as well. High-end telescopes and mounts have these installed at the factory. Telescopes with motor drives can be optionally computer controlled through a handset or sometimes by a laptop computer. These are advertised as go-to telescopes. They typically have a database of thousands of celestial object coordinates. If the controller knows the current date and time and where it's located, it can move the telescope to aim at a selected object. Some of these telescopes get their location and time via Global Positioning System, or GPS. Computerized Alt-As mounts can be moved automatically by the computer in the stair-step pattern needed to track an object. Naturally, all the extra technology costs extra money. Here we are about to demonstrate a computerized go-to telescope. We're going to have it slew from the object, whatever object it might currently be on, to a different one. So through the handset, I just punch in the numbers, and I hit enter, and then I hit the buttons, and there it goes. And if you, have, if you have done all of your alignments beforehand and made sure everything's properly aligned before you get started, then this telescope finds objects for you. You can just punch in the numbers and it goes from one object to the other and you never waste any time searching.
Even a Dobsonian alt mount can be converted to an equatorial by use of an equatorial platform, also known as a poncet table. The rocker box sits on the equatorial platform, which uses a motor to rotate the box and scope around the polar axis. Your latitude determines the depth of the north bearing circle segment. Here is a completed homemade equatorial table. There are also commercially made equatorial platforms that are available. This video clip shows the motion of a telescope on a Dobsonian mount being rotated about its polar axis by an equatorial platform. To see the arcing, notice the movement of the eyepiece. A good solid mount simplifies the operation of your telescope, making your observing sessions enjoyable and fun. If you have any additional questions about telescopes or anything related to space and astronomy, please contact us through our website or by email.